the lockdown and how that has unlocked the games industry. I know it's my bad language, I'm sure. Um, so we've got Stuart Dinsey, who's going to join us from Curve. Uh, we've got um, Branko from Nordius. Kim, uh, oh, I think Kim, we're still waiting for Kim, um, from uh, Kikuri. Uh, Charlotte from Bidstack. Uh, Petri from Rovio. And uh, Sean from um, Kunlon. So hopefully you guys are all going to join us. Uh, I think I've just seen Sean putting his hand up. So hopefully um, you'll all be uh, brought in by James. Um, so, hey Stuart, how, how's things? How's things for you in the uh, land of Curve? They're very good, actually. Um, we've uh, we, we've benefited from one of the things I, I want to talk about, which is we're a digital publisher, and um, you know, lockdown hasn't really affected us in any other way than positively. Exactly, and you've been doing lots of work with football teams, as I recall, as well. So, I'm going to leave you to talk to the teams about lockdown and games. And I'll uh, come back with some questions later. So, see you soon. Thanks, Oscar. Hello, everybody. Hello. Hello, hello. Hello, oh, have we got everybody here? First of all, um, I'm just checking. Yes, it looks like we have. So, I'm going to very quickly walk around and see if you would like to just introduce yourselves briefly to our audience. Um, I know one of you, Charlotte, and uh, and I spoke to one of you earlier, and I spoke to one of you last week, but there are two people here that I don't know very much at all. So we'll start with Charlotte. Just very briefly, can you give us an intro to um, how you, what you do and how you're in the industry at the moment? Yeah, uh, so I'm Charlotte. I work at Bidstack as the VP of gaming. Um, so Bidstack is a native in-game advertising uh, company platform uh, that basically provides the technology to enable uh, games publishers and developers to advertise in their games. Um, I've worked in the industry for just under 10 years now, uh, previously working at Sega uh, and before that at Take-Two um, and also rec most recently at a company called Genba that does digital distribution um, for the games industry. Thank you. Petri? Hello, hello, thanks. So my name is Petri Hyökyranta. I work for Rovio and uh, we are fairly known with our brand, so no, not, not going to talk much about the company here. What I do here is actually that it's my ninth year at Rovio at the moment, been there quite, quite some time, and I'm a CTO, so leading central technology and, and, and IT, and uh, we have a, quite a kind of a strong uh, technical platform that we've created over the years. Okay, thank you. Uh, Branko, I think you're next. Thanks. Uh, Branko here, I'm the co-founder uh, of Nordius. I serve as the chief executive. Uh, you probably know the company uh, through the game called Top 11, which is one of the most successful sports games on, uh, on mobile devices. Fantastic. And Sean? Hi, hi everybody. So I'm Sean Lim. So, um, I've been working at the uh, game industry uh, around uh, 20 years. I've been work at uh, Netmarble and Yahoo, and recently almost nine years at Cool in Korea. And at this moment, I'm working at some kind of esports uh, education and platform as a CSO. Lovely, thank you. And finally, Kim. Uh, hi, everybody. Hello. My name is Kim Suarez. I'm founder and CEO of Kukori Mobile Entertainment, a uh, small but elite uh, Finnish mobile game developer. Uh, I usually say on my background that I have been a gamer since 1979, so it's, it's my sixth decade already being a gamer and for the past 20 years I have been also a game developer. Thank you very much. So, well, um, we'll crack on. Um, my first question is really, it's, it's kind of revealed by the, the topic in, uh, it, it's called, uh, how has lockdown unlocked the games industry? It kind of suggests um, that there has been uh, a benefit to the industry from the, um, the recent period. Um, it can be a little bit embarrassing to admit, but would you agree, and I'll start with Charlotte and we'll go around just naturally, would you agree that whether it's embarrassing or not, there has been something of a, of a COVID bounce for the industry over, overall, either for your business or the industry at large? Yeah, I and mean, I think the industry at large, it was inevitable with people being trapped at home, not allowed out, that they were going to turn to, uh, you know, media and hobbies that um, they could do within their home. And so gaming has directly benefited from that. Um, you know, player numbers, audience numbers increasing 
significantly. Um, I think COVID's probably accelerated some of it, but uh, you know, I think everyone knows the games industry is growing exponentially anyway. So um, I think it's people being trapped at home that has probably accelerated that. Um, in terms of bid stack, we definitely have seen an increase in interest from advertisers because of people being at home. Um, so, you know, traditional out of home options that were there. So tournaments like the Euros this year where people had big budgets to spend, you know, have been canceled. So how can they pivot and strategize to look at new channels? Um, so we've definitely seen a, a positive response in, in that respect on our side. Okay. Petri? Yeah, so on, on Robio's side, it's, it's, been, it's been clear impact. So we've seen an in increase in the number of the downloads. And we have also seen a, a increased user engagement amongst our games. I, I think it's, it's at this point, it's very hard to say how solid that is going to be. But at least so far, we've seen impacts on, on, on maybe on a, on a positive business side, while, while the situation itself isn't anything positive. Uh, one, one thing I'd like to highlight there from the technical angle is that we, we are at the moment interpreting the numbers a lot because there are a lot of LPV models uh, and, and such that we are basing our business operations on. So it's interesting challenge for the data teams to, to, you know, to update the, the behaviors because they've changed so much that it actually may have an impact on the models, how we are using them. I was going to come on to that actually and, and maybe I think we probably all agree that there has been a lift so maybe if I just move the move the topic on just slightly Franco for you just have you seen any particular um, effect on a business model or anything to do with your business as opposed to the wider greater number of people playing games what, what specifically have you noticed the most? Um, so actually uh, Maybe an introspective. So um, there is a, a thing I don't like uh, that has a business impact on us, which is um, social distancing and essentially uh, switching to working from home uh, model kind of all of a sudden. Um, so games are art and science. Uh, a lot of value gets created through collaboration. And then uh, people not being able to, you know, bounce ideas back with each other uh, over a lunch or in a room and all of that uh, makes it quite hard to create new stuff and solve some really complex problems. Uh, so to me, like that, that was, you know, one of the uh, worries of the, of the COVID. Uh, so you mean it the obvious, you know, an, uplift in engagement and all of that. You think it may have an impact on creativity, the individuals working for you? Yes. Uh, so I, I don't think it's going to be so noticeable in the short term, uh, but I, I'm afraid it's going to bite us, you know, uh, over mid and long term. So <clears throat> essentially, there, there are a few components to it. Uh, one is what I just described, uh, collaboration, uh, like people being together, uh, socializing is very important aspect of any workshop or, or anything. And then there is also, you know, the mental fatigue uh, you experience in a lockdown. Uh, and again, you know, our industry is all about brains. So we create and we do work using our brains. Uh, so mental fatigue uh, is probably like the, mm. the, the biggest impediment. Uh, so again, short term, you can't really tell uh, much, but there are some signs. I'm afraid, you know, what's going to happen if, if this continues for a year or two. Sure. Sean, you mentioned that you're currently working on uh, on an esports project. Um, lockdown's kind of curious for esports, isn't it? Because lots of events have been affected and cancelled, and yet um, there's also a belief that it's kind of opened up the idea of esports to the wider general public. Yeah, so actually, digital government orders so all the offline activities, including game or any other industry side all the outside activity is prohibited. Therefore, as you mentioned, like uh, esports, like uh, stadium gathering or some kind of PC cafe uh, playing has been uh, not allowed by the government order. So those kind of sectors are there to some kind of damage. But overall, in, in terms of the overall the game industry, sales numbers are um, it grows comparing to the last year's numbers. So 
when you look at the, some numbers, the, it's kind of 23% of the increase compared to the year over year data. So we said that uh, like a PC cafe or some kind of esports uh, playing some got some negative impact, but generally game industry is, uh, is uh, growing up. Mm. There have been a number of esports events that have actually appeared on TV here in the UK. Is yeah, that, yeah, I'm just that, watching it. Is that a global phenomenon or, or are the UK driving that? Excuse me. Me? I'm just wondering if the TV companies um, have had a number of events in the UK, the, the, the Grand National and some Formula One on Sky. I was just one, I wondered whether you thought that was a global movement and, and broadcasters all around the world are looking for esports content to, to broadcast or whether UK is leading that. Actually, so I'm not sure about the annual or the telephone formulas, other. But so when I'm looking at uh, like uh, the game esports itself, there is no any activities or some uh, uh, the championships in the offline side. Therefore, uh, the we are the older the play older the users that uh, they are just watch at TV, uh, keep the repeated the uh, recording the uh, programs only. Okay. Kim, uh, you mentioned you've been in the business quite a long time um, and uh, you're obviously on the, in the mobile sector. Do you think it is the, I think I read this somewhere, but is it the mobile sector, do you think that has benefited, benefited the most out of any sector of gaming? Um, and do you think if this continues, which we, which we all unfortunately think it probably will, do you think it will affect mobile game design or mobile trends? Uh, did you mean that if, if the COVID has uh, impacted mobile gaming positively more than other other platforms? Uh, yeah, in terms of um, the amount of hours or maybe the amount of money spent, yeah. Uh, actually, I'm not sure because uh, what I see as a gamer myself, for example, I, I do play a lot, maybe even too much, for example, uh, Call of Duty Modern Warfare, and there has been a lot of uptick on, on users and, and downloads and, and play time during the pandemic. Uh, I, I guess mobile sees the same, uh, more or less, as, as other, other gaming platforms. Uh, what somebody mentioned already is that there is an uptick, like in, in of course, time spent, uh, even in some games, money spent as well. Uh, I do think that if this goes on for much longer, it, it, we will see a downside uh, as well, because, I mean, looking at the unemployment figures in the US alone or in different countries in Europe, uh, there's bound to be kind of like people are going to spend less money in the future uh, if this goes on, on for much longer. Yeah, that's, that's increasingly being covered actually. I saw something in the Sunday Times just last week and it seems yeah. saying that the boom in the industry was the worst possible thing that could happen to us. But okay. um, by the way, you, you asked about the uh, uh, esports in, in uh, TV, and at least here in Finland, our national broadcaster uh, does uh, cover uh, CSGO and stuff like that on a regular basis these days. It is happening, as, uh, yeah, as I, I thought it might happen in another, other broadcasters. Um, Charlotte, this, this is. Um, it's a curious one, isn't it, for our industry? Because it, it's been an absolutely terrible time globally. Mm -hmm. It continues. Um, there are a lot of people suffering um, health-wise. And there is, um, as Kim says, potentially an economic hit as well, just around the corner, or going to get worse. Is, it, is, it, is this challenging for our industry in terms of how we respond to benefiting during, generally, a, 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 a terrible time? How, what, what can the games industry do and has the games industry done enough to act responsibly through this period? Yeah, I think like you said, I mean, it's, it's, it's an awkward thing, isn't it, to admit that you would be benefiting from something that, you know, socioeconomically around the world has impacted so many people and been devastating. Um, so I think the messaging people put out has to be very considered um, and conciliatory of that. I think, I mean, there's been lots of coverage probably earlier on, but less so now around, you know, people, large publishers, I think Sony 
in particular donating huge sums of money to funds to help support um, charities and projects you know beyond this um, and I think as an industry it, it, you know it's in our best interest to, to continue doing that through this and um, lots of companies as well have responded incredibly positively to supporting their staff and um, you know through this making sure staff's mental well-being is is looked after and um, I don't work on the development side but I imagine that's been particularly challenging you know continuing projects when people are based remotely and has probably put a lot of pressure on on businesses and um, you know so having to, to come through that but I think ultimately it will, you know, it's been important to respond in the right way. And at Bidstack, we we used our technology to promote the stay home, save lives messaging in Dirt Rally, um, which was something we did in collaboration with Codemasters and Public Health England, because whilst you've got all these people playing, it felt important to, you know, spread out that messaging that was so vitally important in terms of the campaign. Um, so yeah, I think I think the industry is always very good at rallying when it's difficult and they will continue to do so. Um, it will just be an interesting time to see what happens in the next six months or so, um, you know, as we start to come out of this and people return to normality. Absolutely. Petri, alongside that, there is the, um, there's the perception of our industry, isn't there, from, from government. Um, the industry was under a lot of pressure building up to the outbreak of corona towards the end of last year. Um, and um, whether, whether that be business models such as loot boxes, um, or whether it may be just be gaming as a pastime from the World Health Organization. Hmm. Do you think that perhaps the, the, the social benefits or the accessibility of games might have changed some perceptions? Or do you think all of the traditional challenges of our industry are going to come back? That's a, that's a tough question. And, and uh, I, I've been giving it a lot of thought since we've been working from Rovio and also with, with many industry peers on, on topics such as regulation and privacy and, and, and so forth. And uh, one, of the, one of the things in, in this area, for example, you mentioned uh, WHO's World Health Organization and, and, and we, among with many other peers also, uh, were a part of this Play A Part Together initiative. It's, I, it's mm -hmm. kind of a it's easy to lift these things up, but we truly are caring how we message these things to our players and how we message these things to the public. So I, I think it shows somehow. It's maybe a bit naive view into this thing, but in, in my view, at least uh, games, mobile games industry or games industry altogether, I don't think they have shown like not caring at all. I think there's been a plenty of like, like different events, for example, in Rovio, what we did at the very beginning was that we decided not to participate in the shutting down of the economy. So we kept on, even if we closed the, the office and, and, and pushed people to the remote work, we kept on uh, the, the lobby workers and the, and the kind of the facility like like supporters and the staff uh, on, on, on working. And we were able to do a lot of like these like basic um, improvements in the offices, for example, in the meanwhile, while people were home. But the idea of this was that uh, not just us, but I think like all the peers I know, they've been very, it's been very delicate how it's been communicated. Yeah. And yeah, I, I, I can't say more on that, but I, I feel that games industry is doing, doing quite okay there. Sure. Franco, you mentioned earlier <clears throat> the mental well-being of your staff. How difficult has that been? And, and what have you done specifically with your staff to ensure that they don't suffer during this period of working through lockdown and you know, think that you're making loads of money as a company, but actually their, their, their personal happiness may have reduced? Uh, fun enough, we had increase in all engagement metrics uh, of, the, of the staff during these previous months. Um, so there's a few things. So the first, like when, when, the, when the pandemic uh, looked imminent, uh, spreading from China towards Europe, um, it wasn't like super hard to figure out what's going to happen, uh, except to all the governments. But like to people in companies, it was kind of obvious. Uh, so we, we were quite ready uh, in the sense that, you know, the, the first imperative was to really safeguard, you know, lives and, and, uh, um, and the business. So I think that that played a, a major role. Uh, how quickly we enabled everybody to shift to home, not really worry about getting infected and, you know, have enough time to really uh, take care of, you know, their parents or elderly, their children and all of that. 
so we, for example, lowered the, uh, the working week to, to four days uh, and Friday was, you know, flexible, optional. Uh, we did a lot of these things. And then um, as soon as we did that, we moved to actually supporting the community, something Petri uh, mentioned. Um, so we, we've donated a lot of money, uh, bought ventilators. Uh, we also took part in the initiative, uh, play part together. There was just a lot of activities, uh, helping other companies, you know, figure out remote work, whatnot. So I think that, you know, getting together and really sorting the priorities by like, uh, first we safeguard our lives, our families, uh, we help others in need. And then, you know, uh, once we do that, then we will figure out how we can, you know, continue growing the business and all of that. Mm. That really helped people uh, <coughs> feel, feel good and, and then like react on all these things. Kim, one of the things I've noticed that Curve is that, um, I mean, as a company, we, uh, everybody started working from home about a week before the lockdown in the UK. It's about 25 or 30 people. Um, but it feels like, the, the working day for the average member of staff is probably longer um, and, and maybe more intense in a kind of way. There's a, there's a kind of a, an addiction to, to the next meeting and the next task. Do, have, have you found that yourself at your company that um, in some ways uh, it, it, it's created a burden of work, that well, lockdown has created an additional burden of work, if that makes any sense? I mean, I, I think it's obvious that it's easier to keep on working uh, like kind of like unaware that you actually did put in like 12 hours today instead of eight when you're working from home, especially if, if you're not accustomed to it. Uh, but yeah, I, I think people might work more uh, and the, uh, to some extent the hours are more effective because at least our people said that when we started working from home, 16 weeks ago and at least initially people were reporting that they are more productive at working alone from home because there's not like interruptions from co-workers about the new latest cat video or just like this chit chat uh, next to the coffee machine uh, but then again of course we, we had all the plans in place already uh, for the next update and whatnot now that we have been doing this for 16 weeks and now we are making new designs and new stuff for programmers and artists to do then now we kind of like are noticing that it's not as easy to do design or commu communicate it in slack or in, in zoom that it is in a face to face but do the original question? Yeah, I, I think that people are putting way more hours in, mm. even unnoticed by themselves. Yeah, certainly. Well, I mean, we've tried hard. We, we've introduced uh, no Zoom Wednesdays, um, and uh, we try to have a sort of a gathering in the pub um, at five o'clock on a Friday. But um, it's and, and there are a, 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 there is a split, I think, amongst staff of those that are really enjoying it and would like to continue working from home whatever happens and those that are starting to feel a little bit solitary if you like um there are other effects as well and and one of them um sean would be um impact on pr and marketing um do you think that um there has been a uh, an effect that's made it more difficult for companies to do their usual pr and marketing or given that we're in a digital business are we better positioned than other industries to still uh, bring our products to market? Uh, personally, I think um, the PL and marketing side, normally so we do really digitally, we, we solve that issues. Therefore, the, even, even this kind of the situation doesn't make some big impact, negative impact on that. Only we, we do some kind of big title launching. You know, normally we do some kind of media gathering, but uh, only those kind of cases, there is some kind of uh, impact. But generally we feel that no, no the big impact on PR and marketing side. Yeah, yeah. No, okay. Just bringing you back in, Charlotte, talk about events. Um, we've, we've had a few drinks and, and uh, serious business meetings at the odd event over the years. Um, and we were looking forward to being in the uh, in the bar at the top of the Hilton at GDC. I seem to remember. Yeah. Um, 
and, and clearly in, 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 in what you do at Bidstat, you need to talk to everybody. So events are massively important to you. Uh, mm. Events like this have helped fill the gap. But um, do you think that, that that creates a problem for the industry, given that we're such a, a, a positive group of networkers? I think it's, um, it's going to be interesting, isn't it? Because the amount of money that must be spent on travel by companies, you know, every year sending all these people out, the, everyone here I'm sure knows the cost of hotels in San Francisco for GDC is astronomical. Um, and in theory, if you've been able to do effective business development in this period without being at those events, will there be this need to constantly sort of live on the road and out of a suitcase throughout the, the remainder of the year? Um, I think it will make people consider which events they go to and the, the value of those. Um, the digital events, I think, have been really good. And, you know, at first I was a little bit unsure how they were going to work, but actually they've, they've been really good. And the meeting tools that people have come up with and um, things like that, I think, have been really good. But I think, you know, certainly in my area of working, business development, commercial, you know, in human interaction is always going to be important and i think when you're establishing business relationships you want to get to know the person and work with those people well and i think we're never going to move away from completely having that but it will be interesting to see how it pans out um, and i don't foresee any events this year for sure i think we will be looking at digital events who knows gdc next year could be the first one um but maybe in a very different format um you know maybe less large gatherings um but it'll be interesting to see. Um, but I think we've, you know, in terms of how we've managed it, I've actually found, I think because people aren't constantly traveling and catching planes and jet lagged, you know, when you're emailing people to, to speak to them about an opportunity because they are at home and maybe their day, yes, they are working longer, but they have a little bit more time. Um, they've been able to respond and, and have those sort of conversations more up front rather than sort of waiting, catching up 20 minutes at a show and sure. the conversation continuing over time. So Petri, are we going to, are we going to get into? Are we going to get used to not having to go to all the events, and therefore go to fewer, um, and maybe have um, not have as good reasons to spend all that money on flights and drinks? Um, no. or, 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 you know, uh, well, I guess what I'm saying is the the new um, the new way of working will will it affect uh, will it reduce travelling and shows some some of the more sort of traditional games industry habits. I think you need to take my answer with the small caveat that I'm I'm working in the tech craft, leading a a, a group of super technical people. Well, they don't let you out. Who definitely prefer, you know, uh, focusing on what they work and especially when coding. And then again, another other thing, of course, is that I'm also a Finn. So for us, this you know this you know. Keeping the distance of two meters is is just too close, so we normally keep five. But still, still, still want to say on that one that I think that the, there's there's no going back. I mean, there's no normal, anyways. It, times change and things change all the time. But I, I can easily see that, for example, on our side, uh, plenty of people are going to digital events all the time. Uh, plenty of people are still doing the certification exams on the tech graph, for example, all the time. They are all electronic instead of traveling. I, I think that's just going to keep on going. And I, I can say from my own, own, own behalf that a uh, year back, I, I traveled really a lot, visited all, 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 all big players, plus also, also a lot of industry events. And now that those haven't been there, still there are no less meetings or no less meetings with those people in, 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 in states, for example. So it seems that these things can be done this way and I'm kind of welcoming it. I, I think it will be, would be great to travel a little bit, but maybe not go anymore back to that, that like excessive traveling. Well, I'm sure there's plenty of people at Rovio will happily take over your T&E budget for you. <laughs> um, Franco, now, I, I don't think you, I, I'm not sure, I don't know too much about Nordius. I don't think you've done many acquisitions of, of other studios. Um, but obviously, you, you, you talked a lot about staff. And I'm wondering if there are certain parts of the business where we do need a little bit more interaction. I'm wondering if perhaps there may be a slowdown in mergers and acquisitions within the business. And could there even be a slowdown in hiring new staff, I wonder? Uh, so we we have never acquired a company, uh, and I don't think that's going to change anytime soon. So I'd rather not comment on on M and A part of things. Uh, although I'm guessing, you know, 
back to what Petri was saying, uh, it's going to be harder to forge, you know, relationships and partnerships uh, if people are not physically together dating, right? Uh, on the on the personnel uh, side of the of the of the, uh, of the question, so again, you know, there are like two components. One is you know the impact of the industry on on our business. Uh, where so far, you know, we are the, the lucky ones uh, and we don't really have a need to slow down hiring uh, coming from a, you know, P&L perspective. There is another thing, however, which is, uh, again, building that partnership. So I'm not sure how many companies are willing to hire uh, without like having the candidates visit the, the HQ or the offices and, you know, spend some time uh, face-to-face, -face, uh, especially if we're talking about international talent, relocating. Uh, so you would probably want to like, you know, visit the place, <laughs> uh, see the city, meet the people and, and all of that uh, before uh, signing up, you know, for a multi-year uh, change of uh, where you live. So there are some challenges, you know, coming from, from that. that. Mm. Kim, do you have any thoughts on, on mergers and acquisitions? I'm, I'm not sure if you're looking to buy or looking to sell. Um, but uh, right now we are uh, looking to land an investment. Uh, we started to look actively in Pocket Gamer London uh, in January when, when everything was still fine. Uh, but now it's, it's, it's a bit uh, different, if not difficult, at least different. And, and what, what I have been discussing with the different investors or different uh, colleagues from different game companies that have landed an investment lately or are looking is that, uh, well, one thing is that investors can't really stop altogether because they have funds that need to get investments done. Uh, that being said, uh, many of the investors have been kind of like spending the last three to four months on securing their already existing investments because they can't allow them to run out of runaway the invest investments that they have already made in the, some companies but it might be that late this summer like i don't know august maybe september things things might be a bit more normal in terms of in investment landscape but uh one thing is is for certain that if if, if before pandemic you you have to account for at least six months from start to finish to land an investment it's it's now more than more likely like something from six to eight, 12 months. Right. So the time timelines are, are longer. So maybe a delay rather than, uh, rather than fewer, they're just going to take longer to be completed? Yeah, I mean, uh, there was like three to four months kind of like delay, like not many new investments because people were kind of like ensuring that the investment that they have made have enough money to go on during the pandemic and after it, but yeah. It, it will take more time to do those because negotiations take more time. There are no conventions to go. You, you have to either try to uh, take what's best about digital conventions like this, for example. We do have many meetings here as well. Or then just try to get to meetings by yourself uh, outside of digital conventions. But yeah, it, it will take more time. Thank you. Sean, I think you saw a question came up from a, an, an, an anonymous member of our audience um, asking for your opinion about the way Korea uh, responded very quickly to the outbreak of coronavirus. And I, I think you were saying that, that you felt that you were quite impressed and, and the business was perhaps, wider business was perhaps less affected than it, than it has been here in the UK. Uh, when when you say uh, like uh, from the this situations of uh, the all all the, the government trying to make some kind of boosting up all the economy and the uh, consumption boosting, so but uh, the so far the when the government to generally say a little bit negative to the game industry side because there is some kind of the side effect like uh, some criminal some the the reason for that. But recently, the uh, uh, government to try to some kind of try to uh, supporting game industry with some kind of the, some 
the re restriction or some kind of some uh, uh, general the problem issues they try to solve together. So as a part of that, uh, recently we we got to some kind of better the daily consumption the budget increasing. Those kind of with starting that uh, government uh, the top officer tried to meet the set of companies uh, they try to. Uh, uh, discuss about the long term set of supporting programs, whatever. So I, I think so with these situations, the government decide to uh, try to help uh, the, all, all over the game industry. So. Okay, thank you. And in terms of as 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 we move forward, hopefully to things improving, and, and we're all getting more used to it. I'm just I think we're running out of time now, and I, and I will just wait to see if anybody from Steel Media pops up and tells you what to do next. Um, but Charlotte, I'm going to ask, um, are you looking for a return to the office and um, all the bid stack team being together back in an office with masks and socially distanced? Um, for example, Curve, we're in no rush. I'm just, I'm just wondering what the, the, the kind of the feelings amongst your companies are towards what happens next. I think, um, well, Bidstack's based in London, so um, the majority of people have to travel using public transport, which, um, you know, me personally is, is something I have nervousness around. Um, you know, getting on a packed tube again feels like completely a distant memory, to be honest. Um, so we're sort of following government guidance. Um, you know, at the minute, we're not considered key essential workers that need to be back in the office. Um, we've been able to work really effectively from home. Um, our, we're quite fortunate our office is very big so we can spread out quite very effectively um, and the, the office where we are has put measures in place to you know, hand sanitizing stations etc um, so if, if people want to they and feel comfortable doing so safely they can um, but the, the, the company's been really good in sort of allowing people to make the decision that feels right and comfortable for them which I think is important with this because certainly what I've noticed is everyone seems to have taken the impact of COVID very differently. You know, some people are quite relaxed about it and other people have been very anxious and, you know, very, very nervous about it. And you have to be respectful of everyone's position. Um, so I think it'll be a while before we're back where we were, you know, before COVID, but um, it, you know, it's been good to be work somewhere that's supportive of, of people's wishes and making people feel comfortable. Thanks Charlotte. Obviously Petri, Rovio is a very big company. Um, I'm, I, I don't know whether you work from home or whether you work in an office, but what, what is what is the kind of the view of return to HQ? That's a that's a good question. From from our side, uh, we started immediately when the when the kind of uh, the crisis started. So mid March, we we started uh, to give a, a guidance that everyone should work from home. Which, by the way, in Rovio is something that it's allowed anyway. So we had most of the people quite used to that. And then uh, moving on from first of June. Uh, Finnish government uh, released a little bit of the pressure. So it definitely isn't over here in Finland either yet. But the thing is that we also made it possible for uh, people who felt uh, pressure, no matter for what reason, but they couldn't work uh, as efficiently in home anymore as, they, as the others. So we made a survey and we, we basically have opened the office until mid-August. Uh, for these people and the others are still staying, staying home and there's about 450 Rovians all together so it's kind of a kind of a kind of a nice experience to to, to release it like like step by step. Franka what, what do you think will be the, um, uh, the the sort of the lasting impact on the industry of this period however uh, more prolonged it might be what, what do you think is what, what, how will it change this industry? How will people reflect on what happened to our business in 2020? So from a consumer point of view, uh, looking at mobile, I think you know the uplift that happened is gonna, to some extent, uh, stay there. Uh, especially uh, if you look at you know, phones and tablets as, as a second screen experience. Uh, and I also expect you know, some of the new types of games to, to emerge you know, from, from, from that point. So that's gonna be like a direct consequence on, on the business. From a staff point of view, uh, I think it's gonna introduce even 
more flexibility to an already flexible industry. Uh, so we are, uh, we're fully digital, meaning, you know, we are ahead of the curve when it comes to flexibility. But this is gonna show that, you know, we can be even uh, more flexible and that some things that maybe we just didn't think about uh, before, uh, now we're pushed into and, you know, we can, we can take the learnings uh, and, you know, change how the new normal or the future looks like. Kim, do you think, uh, when I put my Yuki hat on, I'm the, the chairman of the, of the Trade Association. Uh, Yuki has been um, asking people to fill in a survey recently, trying to find out, is there anything that, that people in, in the games industry would like to see? What, what could be done, for example, by the government that Yuki could say back to the government, this is the support the games industry needs at any level, whether that's developers, publishers, uh, funding, it feels like the games industry has obviously coped quite well with the current situation. But if there was an opportunity to, to send a message back to governments in different territories of this is the kind of support we could, we could benefit from now that we've been through lockdown and the uh, consequences of lockdown, is there anything that you would love to see offered uh, by governments to support the industry? Uh, well, yeah, uh, I, I might go with the example of what we already have here in Finland at least. Uh, the, the Business Finland, which is like government organization for, for funding uh, tech and, and uh, things like that. Uh, they have two different grants that uh, companies can apply for, both game companies and other companies. Uh, smaller is uh, 10,000 10, euros uh, and the larger one is up to 100,000 euros and I think they have already dished out like around 700 million euros on, on those grants uh, for different companies and I think games industry was quite well uh, represented in, the, in those. Uh, other one is, is, and I think those, those would apply beautifully for, for other countries of course as well for, for other colleagues in, in our companies. And another one is, is kind of like backing up loans that game companies might, might take. Uh, for example, Finis, uh, Finvera, which is government organization as well, is backing up to 80% of the loans that the game companies or other companies will take uh, kind of like in relation to COVID-19. So it, it helps you to kind of like uh, survive the whatever kind of like death valley period we might be experiencing here. But I think, even though, yeah, it, it would be nice to say something more. Uh, but yeah, I, I think it often boils down to money and, and finances. And if governments can help that, they will, long, in the long term, they will save their own money because then, then companies will survive this. Okay. And, and along to actually, on that note, we probably ought to, to close it off, Stuart. Um, I, I, kept, I let it keep, keep going because well, it was quite useful. We, we were happy to go all afternoon. I know, I know you were. Round and round. I, I was also going to chuck in, like, uh, there was a, a, a report from um, the EGDF who were talking about 17% of European studios saying that they would be forced to close as a result of COVID which I'm not too sure if that's happened. It was, a, a few, it was about a month ago, I think, when the survey was done. Um, but it shows the level of um, difference between the success we've been seeing in terms of people's use of games and the slowdown in terms of investment. Most of the studios concerned uh, answering that survey were people who were not cash rich, who were relying on funding. And I know in our, in our case, the publishers we've been working with have not stopped, but they, you know, the timing is kind of the worst possible because end of financial year in the UK and they're not ready to start warming up yet. So I think there is some really interesting problems. But as you said, Stuart, and in fact, all of you have said, well, it's been an amazing kind of period of time for games in general and people's acceptance of the use of technology and distance engagement. I mean, there's lots of really powerful stuff, which I think will be a legacy for the good. But then I also know a lot of my friends who are sitting there on furlough. Uh, and uh, you know, not just in the games industry, outside the games industry as well. And it's a very tricky time for a lot of people. But yeah. um, I do think, in the end, I think to your point, uh, in fact, all of your points in general, uh, it's we. I feel a little embarrassed that things are going so well. Uh, and not least, I think what's been fascinating for me is the increase in the 
importance of social responsibility that a lot of games leaders have shown uh, and uh, you know when we've got uh, the situations going on in the states in terms of black lives matter when we've got the situations that we've got in terms of isolation domestic violence that's happening in um, epidemic numbers throughout you know all of the regions where people are locked down um, we are in a really difficult time for a lot of people uh, and hopefully we can bring at least some joy to as many people as we can well said Thank you, Oscar. Thank you, guys. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you all.